longer, deeper rounds of fasting can be one of the best things that you do for lasting weight loss, but if done incorrectly can actually derail your results. In this coaching call with my patients, these are the top questions and protocols and strategies that we've covered and our patients requested them. And so I wanted to give you guys a deep look into what it's like to get these sort of questions answered. When you work with us, I have clinics that service across the nation and we help patients achieve lasting weight loss every single day. We don't just use fasting and, and lifestyle strategies, but we also incorporate science-backed measures like terzepatide, semaglutide, and powerful peptides. You may think fasting is difficult, but I promise you with strategies like this that you're just about to learn, we make it way easier and we make it much more sustainable. Enjoy. So choosing the date to do your weekly weigh-ins is something that we should decide now. So you probably already know by now the goal is to get you to the point where you're fasting for 48 hours every single week, right? We're not there yet. It's going to take us time to get there. But you want to be thinking right now, when you get there, what part of the week am I going to be doing my weekly weigh-ins, right? For example, I do the typical pattern that I think most people just adopt. I tend to eat more on the weekends. I'm working a little bit less, a little bit less, but I do have more free time on the weekend. So I want to have more of my eating. Plus I do my weightlifting on the weekend too. And you guys will learn why I, strat I, str I strategically do it like that. So I come back in Monday, I eat more keto on Monday after the weekend, and then I fast from Monday night to Wednesday night. So in that example, fasting from Monday night to Wednesday night, my weigh-in date will be Tuesday morning. So basically the morning of the start of your fast is when you want to be weighing yourself week by week. You want to stay as consistent with your weigh-ins as possible, and you don't want to be weighing yourself 24 hours or even worse, 48 hours into your fast because that will throw off your results. I would rather you weigh yourself a day or two early than a day or two late. And if you just if it just happens occasionally because maybe you just forgot, then make sure you put on the notes next to that weigh in 24 hours or 48 hours into fast. Just so that we if we find ourselves needing to reflect on the weigh-ins and we see this off trend, we know why it's off. And then once you're synchronized in that pattern, that's when you would do your shots too as well. We want to do the shot right before the fast, not near the end of the seven day period. You don't want to do your shot and then wait five days and then fast because the seven day effect might not last seven days. And you can't just give yourself a shot before seven days. It uh, doesn't work that way. So definitely synchronizing the start of your fast, your shot, bam, you get into your fast. That's how that weekly rhythm goes. So it might take you a little bit of time to get into that rhythm, but that's the goal here. Like I said last time, I can't give you the medical advice to tell you to stop. It's your decision. If you can't eat enough during a reset, mm -hmm. you won't get through the reset. Wow. And if you're struggling to eat, that's the problem with the med. Yeah. So you're going to have to figure that one out. Stopping would be a solution so that you can get enough calories in, but it's your call. There's a tiny, small chance that you might start gaining weight. But honestly, even if that happened as a side effect, you getting through the reset is the only way you're ever going to start this program with any sort of success. So you have to figure out if you can force yourself to eat and yeah. get through the reset, then great. Do that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to try to push myself. To eat. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to try. I'm, because what? I feel as though either way, with or without the reset, with or without stopping, I have to learn how to prioritize eating even when I don't feel like it. Maybe the only other question is also calorie goals, but are there protein goals? So protein, yeah, we'll, we'll, when we get to nutrition, we'll go more in depth, but basically your target body weight, that's how many grams of protein at the minimum you should be consuming per day. So if you're trying to goal is 140 pounds, I want you to be consuming at least 140 grams of protein a day. And that's probably the only macronutrient, if any, that you should count because it's really easy to count protein. You don't need to, but if you're worried that you're not getting enough, then I would count protein until you get comfortable that you don't need to count it anymore because under consuming protein is just a silly thing to do when it's so easy to get enough protein. If you can't get okay. enough food, if you can't get it, from, if you can't eat enough meat and protein from food, then you supplement mm -hmm. the powder. Yeah. So that, I think that's, that's and I think that's my barrier. I don't really like the supplements, the protein powder, but I have that's the barrier. And of the day and I feel like eating and I don't feel like doing anything. You Look, know, then I have to just do that. 
you're going to have to look whole food is always better. Of course, whole eggs, meat, healthy meat, always better. But yeah. it's worse. It, even if you had no actual whole food for the whole day, I would rather you get all your protein from powder. I hate to say that, but that is better than not getting your protein. So don't be shy on the supplements. Just basically just don't rely on them. Don't get lazy. Figure out how to figure out how to start incorporating more whole food sources of protein into your diet. Yeah. And I think that is a barrier because you think like the, the thought process is like, oh, you want to get away from protein shakes and things like that. You want to eat whole food. You want to be sustainable. But if you're not even getting enough calories, but it's getting rid of that old mindset that eating less is better. hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. The, you, that starvation throw, is good. Throw that starvation. out. Yeah. Just be careful with the choice of word. The difference between fasting and starvation is fasting is a choice and it's a controlled right. environment. It, it, so the physiological response is different. Starvation, you would have to fast for about four and a half to five days in a row continuous to get that starvation response from your body, to get that metabolic down regulation, to hit that plateau. You could fast mm. for three and a half, four days and you won't roughly, and you won't plateau. But if you start doing a four day fast every single week, you're going to plateau really fast. That's why I don't want you guys doing more than 48 on a weekly basis. That's already the world's most aggressive regimen. Okay. Let's, let's keep increasing your diet, your calories. I did just notice that my hair is falling out. So I just saw that as a, as yeah, some, that, I, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, it, it basically the metabolic plateau symptoms are basically low thyroid symptoms. The only difference is it's acute and it'll speed up as it'll stop as soon as you fix the metabolic downregulation versus a true hypothyroid, which is not metabolism related. That's usually been stuck there for a long time and it's not influenced by the metabolism, but this is more of a metabolically induced short-term hypothyroid situation. Physiological starting points, your bodies are all different. Some are way more sick than others. And therefore each of your bodies are going to present its own amount of resistance to this lifestyle. So you guys have a better idea of the resistant your bo resistance your body is going to give you way better than me. The, the third thing is mental strength is a whole nother variable that you guys are going to know a lot better than I would where you fall on the mental toughness thing. And then finally, if there isn't, you couldn't believe that there's more, you guys each have your own stress levels in your life. Some of you guys are comfortable. There's no stress. I'm ready for a challenge. The rest of you guys are fighting to just get through the day. And because of that and the combination of all those variances, you guys drive the car and understand that I'm going to help you course correct. So meaning you get yourself to that 48 hour stage, which is stage three, as quickly or as slowly as you would like. If you want to go slowly, basically that would look like something like this. You're comfortable with intermittent fasting. You go, okay, great. I'm ready for my first long fast. You do your first long fast, which is pushing 18 hours, trying to get to the full 24 hour. Maybe you don't do 24 hour your first time. Maybe you do 20, 22. Every three days, four days, you try it again. Bam, I can do one 24 hour. Great. Now I try to get two of those in a week. Takes me a couple periods of time to get through that. Bam, I can do two 24 hours in a week. Great, I'm comfortable with that. Let me try my first long fast, like really long fast. That's going to be the first day where you take a full 24 hour dinner to dinner and you say, all right, I'm going to bed, no dinner. That's the big leap right there. You skip dinner, you go to bed, you wake up, bam, you eat breakfast that day because that's already like 32. And once you can get to that hump, once you get through that hump, and you do your first overnight, I haven't eaten since dinner the night before. Now you're in flow stage. I only want you to do that one time per week. So even if you're not at 48 yet, even if you're only at 32 or 34 or 36, once per week, you're going to keep increasing that till you get to 48. Eating less processed food is pretty straightforward. Just don't do it. Like I have less to talk about, <laughs> but Eating less processed food is probably just as important as these weekly long fasts. Andrea, yes. So I've done fasting in the past. I've done Jason Fung stuff. I've done 10 day fasts and that kind of thing, but it ultimately screwed up my thyroid and my hormones. So I didn't know back then that you got to 
not fast at certain times of the cycle, that kind of thing. So is that, are we following that here too? Or Yeah. Yes. My, my format is a little bit more aggressive than Dr. Fung's, but because you never do a 10 day fast that often, I, I've already talked to you about how one 10 day fast will destroy your metabolism. You'll recover from it. And there's some good benefits from it, but you can't do that continuously. I have a really good video for women and how to fast as a woman. I'll tell you this though. So Day 13, to I'll give you guys a brief summary, but go watch that video. Day 13 to 15 and day 18 to 28 of your cycle can be problematic for some women. So pay attention to that. If you're noticing huge resistance, <clears throat> if you're noticing menstrual symptoms, especially day 18 to 28, that progesterone phase of your cycle, which is that also called the luteal phase, it would be because the long fasting is too stressful for your body during that time of the cycle. Now, what I've noticed is my women don't have nearly as much issues as other women outside my program who are fasting during day 18 to 28 because of the AOD. So my theory is AOD reduces the stress, reduces the burden that fasting for 48 hours would otherwise create if you didn't have the AOD. So just be aware of that. The, the, the cycle, it's not an issue of your metabolism. So what it is an issue of though is quality of life. Like it's bad. If you, if it's hitting you hard, you need to stop. But the metabolism that's going to be from doing things like fasting for 10 days. That's going to be doing for things like fasting three or more every single week. That's going to be from restricting your calories over too long of a period, right? That's metabolic destruction, metabolic downregulation. 48 hours once per week is about the most aggressive. Most people can do without it causing any sort of metabolic issue. Like 95% of my patients are fine. And every now and then I got to tweak it with for somebody because their body is just really sensitive. So if we were to do that, is it okay to move the fast like a couple of days here or there in a week, as long as we're still doing the, the fast? Yeah. So if you're through the reset, you're rolling and you do notice that you are somebody who, because once a month, you're going to have this happen where your fast falls on day 18 to 28. And if you notice you start feeling like crap, Stop your fast for that week. You can't shift that one because that's the whole, <laughs> it's the whole week, right? Day, if, if it hits you on day 13 to 15, you can shift that because it's a yeah. two to three day. So the food part, like I was saying, this is where I come up with a 90, 10 rule, reduce your consumption of processed foods, shoot for a 90, 10 situation. And you stick with me. I'll, I want to get you to something sustainable, which is more 80, 20, 75, 25 in terms of clean versus junk food. But I really don't want you going hardcore 100 zero, even if you feel motivated to go that hardcore. I'd rather you put that hardcore effort towards lifting weights. <laughs> but don't go too hardcore on your diet. There's a method for my madness. I want you to, to less likely have some sort of binging thing that, that definitely happens to some people when they go too restrictive. So the I call it the anti-processed food diet, which... When I talk about paleo Mediterranean, those are just two common categories that are representative of this anti-processed food diet. And the only modification of it that we're going to do is we want to go keto as much as we can for the first couple months. And then after a couple months, I do a, I do a follow-up like this intimate style every two months. If you're still in my coaching program, then we'll just be, we'll remind you then two or three months into it. If things have been going smooth, I do want you to start introducing carbs back into your program. Just to, it's almost a test to show us, all right, on a weekly level, you're eating more carbs, not every day, but maybe three days, four days a week. And, and you're still losing weight. That's a good sign. That means you are less insulin resistant. So that's something more to worry about when we get to that two to three month phase. And then the other piece of it is how you eat when you break your long fast. And I have that whole section on the form, basically eating lighter and taking a full day to recover from your fast is really important. Low carb is fine. So yeah, like low carb keto, the only difference is you you can call keto ultra low carb, right? And that's at the end of the day, low carb is still going to be beneficial. So the fasting, the 48 hours per week is the most powerful thing you can do to heal insulin resistance. Now, the reason why I add keto for the first two months is because that's when your body's the most sensitive. And for some people fasting, but then eating moderate to high carbs on the other five days, they're, if they're counteracting. And for some yeah. people, it won't be enough to get, because remember, insulin resistance is like a switch. We have to pass a certain threshold for the resistance 
the insulin resistance can start to reverse. And then once you're, once you become more insulin sensitive, which is the opposite of the same thing as decreasing insulin resistance, once you become more insulin sensitive, then all of a sudden things become easier. Then all of a sudden you can tolerate carbohydrates better because you don't have this resistance phenomenon where your body has to pump out so much more insulin to get the job done. So it's like getting your body through that threshold, which is completely unique to each and every one of you. So you can go a little less strict on the keto and your body is going to tell us based off of the results, whether or not it's a problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I would say low carb is fine. If you are counting your carbohydrates, 50 grams of net carbs or less. I always say shoot for 30. If you did 30, 50 net carbs, I think that's still pretty good alongside the fasting. Okay. Cool. Okay. So supplements. You said 50 carbs, sorry, a week or per day would be the, the goal to get that or less. All right. So supplements. So I broke out, I broke up the supplements into categories. As you guys can see, the essential is just like I laid out the essential supplements. That's the bare minimum that all of you guys should be taking, not even for weight loss, just for optimal health, right? So I have a link there where you can purchase them. I don't care whether you purchase from me. I'm not in the supplement game. That's not even what I necessarily care about. I just want to make sure you guys have the adequate nutrition that you need for the best results. So the magnesium, the vitamin D, the essential fatty acids, the, the multivitamin or greens, that's the base. The curcumin resveratrol, if you do have an autoimmune disease, if you do have an inflammatory condition, curcumin is almost as important as everything else. If you don't, curcumin's kind of still very powerful and can still help. But if you needed to prioritize for cost budget, that's probably what I would cut out of the essential if you needed to and you don't have one of those inflammatory conditions. And the electrolytes are essential because we're doing so much fasting. And do not skimp out on this step right here. Some people forget this because it seems so silly, but a quarter teaspoon of salt per day when you're fasting for 24 hours. So if you're having some really bad sugar cravings, if you know you have some gut issues, if you have some high liver enzymes, we're going to talk about stress and sleep here in a second. And then a lot of people have been asking me about the anti-aging NMN protocol from David Sinclair. You can get NMN there as well. Okay. So extra appetite suppression. So if you are taking terzepatide, that's going to be your main appetite suppression. But my favorite additional appetite suppression is the fill great system. So it's going to be very differently though, how we recommend using it. So the having the Unimate in the balance is nice to be able to give you some additional appetite suppression in situational scenarios, right? So it's going to last you much longer than what they're saying, because you're not going to use it every day. Now, the other thing that some of my patients do is they, they understand the concept that the lower the dose of your GLP-1, the easier it's going to be to wean off, right? Let that sink in. The higher you go, the harder it's going to be to wean off. Not impossible. I've had patients who are so sick that we had to get them to the high range of terzepatide. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is, if you keep that mentality from the beginning, the lowest dose of terzepatide, the better it's going to be for me in the long run then you understand why maybe a combination of terzepatide plus appetite suppressing supplements might be the better path. Obviously, that's more work because now you have to play around with the supplements and find the right balance and find the right combo and yada, yada, yada. So this is going to be your call, but I would absolutely rather you have an increase in those supplements than increasing your medication dose. But that's going to be something that you're going to have to figure out if you like your starting point out so far. Other than that, we'll see you guys in the next coaching.